you for logging on to monstergardens.com. We're here to talk to you about a really great educational video, and that is how to mix a reservoir. There's gonna be two parts to this video. So part one is gonna be a synthetic regimen, part two is actually gonna be an organic regimen. And we decided out of all the different lines that we carry just to pick two, just to keep it real simple. And that was for the synthetics, we're gonna be doing Grow More because it's just gonna be a three part, which is very familiar to what many of you guys are doing out there. Now on a regular basis, we get a lot of technical support calls exactly about which order do I add my nutrients, what the pH level should be, which which component do I add? Which ones do I take out? So we're gonna hear and we're gonna talk about all those different questions and we're gonna give you all the answers today. So let's go ahead and fill up this reservoir. All right, so here we have our reservoir filled up. We figure this is a just under a 30 gallon tote, so we're gonna go ahead and just fill it up. We're estimating roughly about 25 gallons in here, so that's what we're gonna be taking our measurements based on. Now, what I generally like to do for people is I like to underestimate my gallons, not necessarily put everything to the T. So the most common, for example, is a 55 gallon drum. Generally, what I encourage people to do is take their measurements based on 50 gallons. Now, certain people are gonna request other regimens. Certain people are gonna have their own special tricks that they do. It's worked really well for me in my past to always measure to 50 gallons when I do have a 55 gallon drum filled up. That is gonna favor someone that's gonna be a little bit more conservative on their nutrient solution, as well as running a risk, not running the risk of burning their plants. Now what we're gonna do is talk about a few pre-measuring tips that we like to encourage here at Monster Gardens. First, you're gonna see that we do have a recirculating pump down at the bottom. Now what this is, just a mag drive pump, doesn't matter which size, it, we encourage it to be uh, one large one if you wanna be using just a single pump or a few smaller ones. Well the one I have here for this size is just a 250 gallon per hour pump. Real basic mag drive pump that's just gonna circulate the water. That's all it's really doing to encourage, no, to encourage any of those nutrients to not fall out of solution or rest at the bottom of the reservoir. Now, another thing to keep in mind is that you want to have chlorine free water, at, le at least ideally if you're trying to harbor beneficial bacteria in your root zone. Now what chlorine is going to do is, it's, chlorine is often found in city water and most of your carbon or sediment filter, filter devices are going to pull the chlorine and ideally the chloramines right out of the water. However, chloramines is going to be the ammonium based chlorine molecule that's actually only pulled out out of a KDF carbon filter. Only going to see that on your reverse osmosis systems with an upgrade filter option. Now what we did here is we have in the store here for our compost tea brewer we have the boogie blue water filter which is basically a carbon filter and sediment filter that screws onto the end of a hose and that's what we use to fill this water. So because this is a uh, so because this is not going to be feeding any organic garden where there's going to be a lot of root inoculants, a lot of compost teas being fed, we aren't as concerned about using RO water. Now our customers that are using organic amendments or are using beneficial fungal spores or bacterias, we encourage you to use a high-end carbon filter that's going to pull out all the chlorine out of the water and the chloramines or by using a reverse osmosis water filter. But you need to keep in mind you need to add that calcium and magnesium back to the water if you do decide to use RO water. So for this instance, this is using tap water, but it is using what the chlorine been taken out. So let's go ahead and uh, talk about a few things. So this time of year, in the winter time, pipes are a little cold, and so what's going to come out of the tap is going to be usually a little chilly for the root zone. What we encourage everybody is 68 to 72 degrees. I'm going to say that one more time, 68 to 72 degrees. Now you may notice again that your pipes are cold, so the water is going to be coming out well below that. So that's where we have over here our very simple aquarium reservoir heater. Now I just pulled one off of our shelf, so they actually come in various different sizes for different size reservoirs. This one here is a 200 watt, so it's ideal for anything between 26 and 53 gallons. Now. Obviously it's a big range on that, so what that boils down to is how fast do you want that water to be heated. Generally what I do is I go with a medium sized aquarium heater just like this and it's on most of the time maintaining that temperature. Now we're going to come in and close on this and you're going to see that there's actually a little thermometer dial on there. That guy right there is not fully waterproof. It's designed to actually be mounted vertically along the reservoir with the suction cups that are provided. Now other all metal versions of these heaters are going to be fully metal or glass. This one is a glass one, but actually the top is also waterproof. Keep in mind customers, keep in mind for those of you that have purchased this or are planning on purchasing this, do not fully submerge this or else it will void the warranty. 
So that's just a really important thing, especially in the winter time. You may be looking at your leaves and wondering, gosh, why are my leaves yellowing? Uh, it could be a number of things. Obviously your pH could be off, your room could be cold, you obviously could be missing out certain elements out of your nutrient regimen. But the big ace that's always up everyone's sleeve that no one ever seems to think about is the temperature of the water. Now, in the winter time, especially if you're in an open air system or you have concrete floors in your garden, your root zone may be chilly, especially in the nighttime when the lights are off. So keep in mind that when you're feeding plants at the right temperature of the water, it's gonna allow those nutrients to be taken up much even, much more evenly and especially easy for the plants. Now, Time and time again do people come in with nutrient deficiency problems when they have a complete nutrient regimen. So being able to rule out the temperature of the water is a really good thing to be able to keep in mind. Now most of the meters on the market, such as this Blue Lab combo meter here, is actually gonna give you a digital readout of the temperature. So definitely keep in mind that this is a really good tool to have in your garden as well as a very simple mercury thermometer that's gonna float in your reservoir and tell you the temperature, this is gonna be precision. It's gonna actually give you a digital readout. So not only are you gonna be able to read your pH, your parts per million, but you can also get the temperature of the solution. Very important. Another big important thing to do to keep in mind while before you add any nutrients to your water is what's the parts per million to begin with? Some people talk about hard water or soft water. Here at Monster Gardens, what we classify hard water is, is generally anything above three to 400 parts per million. It's not as common in city water because the city has a very good way of maintaining the level of calcium, magnesium, and iron that is in the water. So generally the parts per million are going to be under 300. But on well water, for example, that's often where you're going to see the hard water. And so we do make uh, water softeners, or obviously the carbon filters are going to pull out some of those minerals out of the water. But the important thing to know is a lot of these companies, they do make a hard water option for their micro, which is just going to contain a little less calcium. Calcium is the main thing that's reading the high parts per million. In very warm environments or strains that have a tendency to have stem breakage or ones that just simply can't hold the heavy flowers once they get late into flowering, potassium silicate is a really common solution. Many gardeners have, them, have had them in their regimen and don't even necessarily know what it does. But what the big thing about that is it's gonna increase the size of the cell wall on the stalk itself. It's gonna, so it's gonna allow for more nutrient uptake, but more importantly, it's gonna give you kind of this woody, rigid look to the stalks. And so the plant is gonna actually be stronger. It's gonna be able to hold that heavy weight. It's gonna, it's gonna be able to withstand a drought or a lack of watering or even a heat wave that may roll through. So especially you outdoor gardeners growing in the warmer areas such as the Central Valley, potassium silicate is a must. You really wanna be giving your plants potassium silicate in some form because it's gonna bulk the size of the plants and it's gonna prevent future stem breakage and prevent plants to just keel over and die because you say missed a day of watering. Um, hydro people, also important for you because you're relying on a pump most of the time. So really important to have a little extra armor coat for your plants. Give them that strength that they need. Now, what most manufacturers don't tell you is that potassium silicate has a pH of around 11. Uh, pH of 11 going into a nutrient solution that's going to be under 7, that's probably going to lock out most things. Now, when you pour the solution, it's going to seem real milky, and so the average gardener, or at least someone that's new to this, is going to see it cloud up in the water with everything else in it and wonder, oh gosh, that looks very milky. That's a very thick solution. Well, the really, the really big thing that's going on is your micronutrients have just locked out and sunk to the bottom of the reservoir. And it's because it's such a drastic shock of a high pH going into a mild to slightly acidic pH that's already in the water. So us indoor gardeners, gardeners and outdoor gardeners for that matter, we always encourage potassium silicate to be added first. Now, everyone knows micro first, micro first, micro first. Unless you're RO, then you're adding CalMag first. Potassium silicate needs to go before all of that and make sure it's mixed in very well before you add anything else. Any random pockets of a high pH is going to lock out certain elements. So definitely all of you out there that are using potassium silicate, over stir and add it first. So we're sitting over here over our reservoir, going over a mental checklist, or for this video, a verbal checklist, and you're looking at the water and you're thinking, man, I'm excited to feed these plants. I got my temperature right. It's right between 68 and 72. I measured my parts per million of my water and the, I measured my parts per million of my water to begin with, so I know how much CalMag to add or not at all. And I have all my nutrients sitting on the shelf. So the big thing that I like to encourage everybody, especially because most of you are mixing around 7, 8 p.m. at night when most hydro stores are closed, is go through your bottles and make sure there's a little bit of liquid in all of your solution. Make sure there's at least a little bit of liquid in all of your bottles. 
just so that way you don't run out. You know, the last thing you want to do is be halfway through a reservoir change and you just ran out of micro or you just ran out of bloom. So definitely stock up on a little higher size and visit monstergardens.com and make sure you replenish your nutrient shelf. We've gone through our mental checklist and we're ready to start mixing. So what I'm going to grab first, like I mentioned earlier, is potassium silicate. This is a really great one from Grow More because it's extremely concentrated. Now, potassium silicate is oftentimes pretty thick, especially when it's as concentrated as this one. So I always like to give my nutrients a big shake. Now when the, new, when the bottles are new, it might be a little harder to shake, but I like to really go for it. I'm a big shaker kind of guy, kind of like as if it's salad dressing. Now, like I mentioned earlier, this is a 25 gallon reservoir. This is my favorite measure beaker to use because it has all the different measurements on all sides. At the same time, I encourage anyone to pick their favorite beaker because mixing nutrients is one of my favorite things to do. So pick a friendly beaker and go with it. 25 gallons, this one is, always encourage you to read the bottle before you start going. So this one here, five mils per liter, which means it's actually going to be 20 mils a gallon. Now this is a 25 gallon reservoir, so you do the math, that's 500 mils. All right, so we got it all poured out. Now what I always encourage everybody, again, silica goes in first, but you want to dilute it. So I pour it in the water like that. I don't just dump it right in, I actually dilute it first. Okay, usually clean out my, my little beaker a couple of times. And what that's gonna encourage you to do, it is gonna encourage the solution to be diluted before it just pours right into the concentrate. Not as important on your first few bottles, but, I, but definitely once more and more nutrients start getting added to the water, you always wanna make sure and dilute. So I brought a little stir stick around just so that way I can make sure that silica is really well mixed before everything else is poured. Like I mentioned earlier in the video, if there's any little pockets of silica, it's gonna be a little high pH floating around. It has a very good job at, dil at diluting itself in the solution, but the last thing you wanna do is lock out some of your micronutrients, because that's the next thing to go into the batch. So, we got a really good mix going on. I generally like to get a little bit of a vortex swirl. Okay. Now, micro always goes in first, unless you're using potassium silicate. The reason why you always want to add micro first is because that has the most sensitivity to the pH. Now also, the big thing to know about this too is this is what's often going to make your water back normal again. A lot of times people are starting with RO water and they have a clean slate. Really just hydrogen and oxygen in the water. So this is going to allow you to add more of a equilibrium when it comes to calcium, magnesium, and iron back into the solution. You're gonna notice micro is red, and that's because it has a lot of the iron in it, but also this particular Grow More micro has a little seaweed in it as well. That's what's gonna give it that dark, thick, that's what's gonna give it that dark, thick color. So, especially with the Grow More micro, make sure and shake it really well so you don't get that little layer of seaweed at the very bottom. I've had a couple of people lately come back just, just wondering what that was, because they haven't seen that in the GH Flora micro, but uh, this one has a little additional seaweed added to it, so definitely make sure and mix it to get the most bang out of it. Now, this micro is, all, is five mils a gallon, very concentrated, half of the industry standard. So what I'm gonna go ahead and do is go to the milliliter side. We have 25 gallons in here, so that's 125 milliliters. Hundred and twenty five. Go ahead and just I'm gonna set this down so I can screw my micro back shut. I always like to screw the caps back on as quick as I can so no contaminants land back into the bottle. Back onto the nutrient shelf. Now you're gonna see it a lot easier with this one than on the silica, how I dilute it before I dump it in. I just pour I let the water get in, dilute it in my beaker cup, and then I basically just dump her on in. No reason to be in a rush when you're mixing up nutrients. You wanna make sure that all of these things are in the solution evenly. You always wanna make sure that they're in there at the right concentration and at the right pH level. Because this is what's being feed, this is what's gonna be fed to your plants. This is what your plants are gonna thrive on and what's gonna give you the yield they deserve. So give them the right amount of nutrition at the right pH level and make sure it's all mixed in really well. Now it's time to add your grow and your bloom. 
Now you viewers out there, you might be wondering, well gosh, I don't use a three part and I especially don't use that particular one. What do I do with my AB? What exactly do I do? Well, if you look at your A versus your B, you're gonna notice that your A has a very dark color and your B is gonna often be pretty clear, if not perfectly clear. The reason why you're gonna see your AB having different colors is because your A has your micro in it. The same principle why you add micro first is the same reason why you wanna add A before B. You always wanna add A, mix really well, just like your micro. Always wanna add your micro, mix really well, then you add your B. Your B is basically gonna be a combination of your grow and bloom. Oftentimes it's a little bit more of your bloom because most growers phase their grow out when you get into middle to late flower. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to mix a transition reservoir. If you look at the feeding chart on a transition stage, you're going to see it's going to be equal parts, which is going to be on grow more, five mils of all micro grow and bloom. So just for simplicity, we're going to mix the same reservoir. So we're transitioning from grow into bloom. Five milliliters per gallon, 25 gallons. It's going to be 125 milliliters. All right, so we're going to go ahead and dilute this in there. I always like to use a very heavy duty stir stick. Some people like to use the Blue Lab truncheon. Just I don't really like to like the idea of that because it's a very expensive stir stick. So I just use a simple bamboo stake. Works fairly well. I just don't like to keep it in the reservoir at all times because they oftentimes are hollow and harbor pathogens or any anaerobic bacteria that doesn't correspond well with the root zone. So definitely encourage you to keep your stir stick outside the reservoir. Um, that is if you're using a bamboo stake. All right, so we have our our grow mixed in there with our micro and our potassium silicate. So now it's time to add a little bit of bloom. You're going to notice many people are going to be using a Lucas formula. The Lucas formula is going to be a micro and bloom solely and they completely cut out the grow, which is totally fine, but I find for a longer vegetative growth, it's really important to use your grow as well as the bloom. So it's only going to work for a quick veg. If you're vegging for any longer than say four weeks, three, four weeks right in that range, you're probably going to want to keep a little bit of grow in there or at least supplement with some kind of an extra nitrogen. Nitrogen is very important for foliage, for foliage development as well as stem elongation as well as if, if you're just simply topping your plants a lot, you need to give them enough nitrogen so they shoot new, so they grow new shoots quickly. So I very much encourage you to use all three parts. However, you can get away with just the micro bloom, but really only if you're using a short flower, especially a short veg time. So what we have here is the bloom. It's also gonna be five mils per gallon because we're doing the transition formula. So that's gonna be 25 milliliters. Now you're gonna see this one's really clear. They like to add uh, dyes into their three parts so that way people, if they have workers that maybe don't speak English or people that just are uh, more visual learners rather than literary learners that are gonna learn off of a label, um, colors are a really easy way to do it. And so that's why many companies are gonna throw dyes into their solutions. Um, it's not to be cheap. It's not to put an extra filler into their solution. It's really just so that way workers down the line can tell the difference. So what we did here is we added a little bit of bloom to it. And what you're going to notice is our nutrient solution has actually gotten a little bit lighter. And really it's just because we're diluting a little bit more into it and the pH is changing slightly. All right, so the last thing is a little bit of CalMag. Many people look at me like I'm crazy because I don't add my CalMag first. You can, you definitely can. You could go potassium silicate, CalMag, micro, and so on and so forth. However, the reason why people like to add CalMag first is so they know where they're starting with. When you're using a reverse osmosis water, you're gonna be starting with a clean slate, most likely zero parts per million. That is if your carbon filters are new. So say you're starting with zero or anything under 10 parts per million, and you need to add roughly 250 to 300 parts per million of CalMag. That makes it very easy to just add this first. You go from zero to 250, boom, CalMag's taken care of. Well, you can just as easily add this at the end of your regimen if say you measure your parts per million and you're around 900. Well, you want to get it up to 1150, you can add 250 milliliters of CalMag in there. That's totally sufficient. But 
for peace of mind, most people add this first. But for this video, I'm gonna go ahead and show you guys that it doesn't matter. You can add it at any time in your reservoir as long as it's in there because calcium and magnesium is very important. So for this mixture here, this is actually gonna be a, a measure from two to four milliliters per gallon. So what I'm gonna go ahead and do is just do the full strength just so it's a little bit easier. So four milliliters to the 25 gallon reservoir, that's 100 milliliters total. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna go to the 100. Now what you're gonna notice on a lot of the Grow More products is they're slightly more concentrated than the rest. They do this because they're a big ag company and it makes it a lot easier for them to bottle more concentrate so that way the end user is actually getting a little bit better of a deal. Now as we talked about, this is part one of our video, this is going to be a synthetic regimen. We are soon going to show you how to mix an organic regimen, but that's going to require a few different extra steps. Now the big thing about that is going to be additional stirring, whether it be stir pumps or just additional stirring in between bottles because things are a little heavier, they have a tendency to fall out of solution. But for this particular video with the synthetics, things are pretty thin. They only really need one single stir pump and occasional stir just to make sure that things are mixed in well. But as you can get a close up on this, I mean this water is pretty darn thin. I mean it's, it's, I mean it's really quite thin. Granted, Gromor is known to be a low salt nutrient company, so that might be attributing to it, but gosh, I mean, this would run great through drip emitters. This would run great through any type of flood and drain, any, any type of a top feed system. I mean, uh, this would be a great solution for really any type of a setup. Now, the big thing to keep in mind, though, is when people are running hydroponic systems or synthetic nutrients in general, is generally you're running either a, a sterile or you're running a biological approach. So you're either taking a sterile approach or a biological approach. Now when you're taking a sterile approach, oftentimes you're going to be using things like hydrogen peroxide. So that way you're going to kill off any bacteria, whether it's beneficial or not. Most of the time people are going to be using like a hydrogen peroxide type solution. And what that's going to really do, just like a, a sore on your arm, is it's going to kill off any bacteria. Now that might be beneficial bacteria. It might be pathogens. You just got to keep in mind that when you're running a hydrogen peroxide solution in your nutrients or to clean systems, it's going to clean everything. So if you're running an organic regimen or if you're running with a biological approach, I definitely encourage you not to use hydrogen peroxide because it will wipe out any colony and you'll be forced to re-inoculate right after that. However, for this particular segment of the video, we'll talk about more, a, more of a sterile approach, which is going to be common in a deep water culture. Deep water culture, you're going to be cycling nutrients like crazy through all of your buckets. A lot of times these things are daisy chained together. Um, a lot of times it's just all in the same nutrient solution and there's not much of a buffer at all between the fertilizer and the roots itself. So it's important to keep things sterile so that way no anaerobic bacteria are forming in there. That way there isn't any random slime that be forming on your roots or in the random pockets of your DWC system. Um, hydrogen peroxide is very commonly ran through a system like that. And the reason is just Keep things sterile, like I said, for, just like it would on a cut. But also you're adding additional oxygen in there, which is gonna be beneficial for root growth. Now, you can run the same exact nutrient solution with a biological approach. Just all you're gonna be using is a lot of beneficial bacteria, such as uh, Serenade, or such as the ones that you'll find in the OG Bio War, um, such as Sea Green. And what those are gonna do is be these beneficial bacteria that help consume anaerobic bacteria, or they help uh, dominate them in the same way that a white blood cell would for a pathogen in the body. So you want to have these beneficial organisms that are going to fight for you. It can be very difficult though if, if temperature gets out of whack or if your nutrient solution is out of whack in any way, those anaerobic bacteria may be a little bit more dominant in that root zone. So for any type of synthetic regimen or any type of hydroponic regimen, we really encourage you to take the sterile approach. However, it is definitely possible to go with the biological approach. Just definitely encourage you to use those certain products that we talked about. So as far as nutrient solution temperature, like we talked earlier in this video, it's mostly crucial in a hydroponic system, more specifically the ones that are gonna be submerged in the nutrient solution, such as a deep water culture or a flood and drain type situation. I definitely encourage the reservoir heater so you can maintain the right temperature. So let's go ahead and let's uh, measure the pH and the parts per million of this solution here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm basically gonna press the on button, put both the probes in. 
As we talked, it's always encouraged to store your pH meter wet just to encourage the most accurate reading. Um, again, about pH monitoring, you always want to make sure that it's calibrated. Most meters will still tell you if it's calibrated or not or it needs to be. However, twice a month for maintenance is definitely encouraged. That's going to make sure that the life of your meter is going to be the strongest and you're not skipping any waterings that your plants aren't getting a false reading. You always want to make sure and move your meters around for the most accurate read. The last thing you want to do is have a little pocket in that water that's reading a little higher of nutrients or reading a little low or high on the pH. So I encourage every grower out there to always move your meters around for the most accurate reading. Now you can see we were mixing a transition reservoir, so a pH of around 6 to 6.3 is very ideal. Granted, if you're in a cocoa fiber medium or you're on a recirculating system with rock wool that has a tendency to raise the pH over the course of the week, most people pH around 5.5 5 to 5.8, still encouraged for the most nutrient uptake to be between 6.0 and 6.3. So you can see this reservoir at 6.2 is pretty ideal. And then we'll just press right over to the nutrient and it's reading 1300, 1280, 1290, right in that range. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set my meter down and then you can just pull your probes right out of the solution. However, you wanna go right away and you wanna put your pH meter right back into its case so that way you know it's being stored wet. Parts per million meters are pretty indestructible, however, I still encourage everyone to keep them cleaned. Uh, calibration will still probably want to be right around once a month, but you may notice that your calibration is always going to be on point as long as you're keeping your meter cleaned. All right, so now that you have your nutrient solution mixed, you know that your parts per million isn't too high, that your plants are going to burn, you know your pH level is set right where it needs to be for proper nutrient uptake. Now let's talk about a few things that I didn't add to this reservoir that might make this a little bit better. Uh, I encourage everyone to use a fulvic acid. Fulvic acid is going to help a lot with that uptake of the micronutrients. You're going to notice that the fulvic acid by bioag that it would you're going to notice that the, full, the fulvic acid by BioAg called Full Power is the one that we endorse. You'll see on some previous videos. And that one is not going to fluctuate your pH at all. However, it does have a very minute parts per million increase, but it is maybe about 10 to 20 parts per million. So it's not going to really drastically affect your plants. If anything, you're probably going to want to kick down your application rate slightly because that's going to allow for more nutrient uptake a lot quicker. So if you're feeding your plants, say, a 1280 parts per million solution, you may want to kick it down a little below 1200 if you're using a fulvic acid just so you don't burn your leaf tips.